with Ali Lovett, who's one of the founding partners at Radian Capital. How did this whole story come about? How did you get from New York, wait, no, Boston? Boston. How'd you get from Boston to Radian Capital in New York? It's a long journey. A bunch of stops in the way. <laughs> in a couple minutes. Yeah, like, to be what's clear, the, what's the... I grew up in Swampscott, Massachusetts, so I want to give a shout out to the North Shore of Massachusetts. So I'm not technically from Boston proper, but um, went to Yale, graduated mm -hmm. with an econ degree, did not know what I was going to do with that whatsoever. So um, had the benefit of a couple college friends of mine who were a year above me pursuing finance. And so got an internship at UBS on the fixed income trading desk, fixed income rates and currencies. Um, did that summer after junior year, fell in love with the energy of the trading floor and the people, ended up getting a full-time offer and joined full term, which um, the way that they do it, you end up rotating around all of the desks within that group, um, within the bank, and then you know more or less kind of like a placement for residency. You yeah. select your top ones, they select you, and I landed on a fixed income prop test that traded asset-backed securities, which was pretty interesting at the time because this would have been sort of the heyday of the trading floor where people were incredibly successful and um, we were investing a lot on the the um, off the balance sheet for UBS. It was great. Um, I did it for two years. I have to say though, I felt like when I looked at the people around me and you know the day to day was pretty similar and I yeah. felt like having come from an econ background as opposed to a finance background, it didn't have a good breadth of finance 101. So decided to, I guess, restart my career and go back to banking, which um, for the people on the trading floor was just blasphemy. They just couldn't believe that I would take a step back after having been there on the, on the prop desk. How and did you announce that? Was it like, ding, 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 I'm out of here? Well, it has or to be. It has to be. So you literally go tell your boss, who yeah. is the head of the, the prop desk at the time, that you are leaving. And the first thing he does is call security and <laughs> you have a handful of security guards come and escort you off, which at the time, this was the trading floor in Stanford, Connecticut, which yeah. had thousands of people on it. Um, and what was kind of comical is everyone cheers when you leave, which I don't know. <laughs> Did you might throw or anything thing. or was it just No, just, and... just people just get up and start clapping and cheering as you're escorted off. And, uh, and that was <laughs> sort of the last day I stepped foot on the trading floor. So um, good experience definitely uh, helped me navigate what I really wanted to do, which was better understand companies specifically as opposed to just financial markets, pull companies apart, put them back together. And for me, the first step in, in, in really figuring that out was banking. And so- what, Maybe rewinding a little bit, why did you decide to go into trading as opposed to all these other different careers in finance? <clears throat> I mean, you could probably, probably have the options coming out of Yale. So you, if you wanted to go into banking or something along those lines. So when I took the internship, I didn't really know better one way or another. I had a handful of friends going into investment banking internships, a handful going into sales and trading. Yeah. I happened to go to sales and trading. I was probably drawn to the personalities in the trading floor, a bunch of former athletes, a ton of energy. You walk into that place and you just enjoy being there. It's just really intense it's like and a really fun. like field on a trading, <laughs> yeah. like in the trading It's usually floor. a football being thrown around, or at least back, back then there was. Um, so it just felt pretty natural as opposed to being, um, uh, it just felt natural. And I, again, it was an N of one, so I didn't have, you know, the, all that much exposure. And then coming out of that and having a full-time offer with having had such a positive experience on, on the internship yeah. felt like a no-brainer. And UBS at the time was just a great firm to work for and the trading floor was massive and it was a blast. So took the offer and then realized, could I see myself doing this for the next 40 years? And I think the answer was, was no, or what else is out there? So <clears throat> ended up pursuing um, banking opportunities, which led me to reconnecting with um, a former Yale girlfriend of mine, this woman named Amy Jane, who now runs an incredibly successful company called Bobble Bar here in New York. Um, she was taking a leap of faith with her boss, who was a the head of the UBS Consumer Group, who was leaving and joining forces with um, another excellent banker um, coming from Morgan Stanley to create this new firm called Centerview Partners. Um, yeah. It's now a massive, yeah. investment bank and um, <clears throat> incredibly successful, but I ended up choosing to go work with uh, fellow alums and try my hand at an analyst program that was supposedly going to be a little bit different than the traditional banking two-year program. And it did not disappoint. Um, very intense hours, as you can imagine, yeah. but the exposure that I got to um, you know, the CEOs of, of companies like Pepsi and Campbell Soup was was off the charts. So did that for two years. I think things have even accelerated 
more than than what it was when I was there, which is you step foot and you kind of have to decide within the first 12 months whether you're going to be a career banker or start pursuing other paths. And if you decide to even pick your head up and consider something like getting into the hedge fund world or private equity, a lot of those firms start recruiting um, you know, Fair eight enough. months into the job. I think it's even earlier now. And so I was really quickly um, confronted with that decision and I had had the benefit of seeing a bunch of my friends who were now two years accelerated from me having not sort of restarted their careers um, try their hand at investing. So I had sort of a front row seat, my husband being one of my now husband being one of them, into what the world of investing was like and um, <clears throat> definitely intrigued me. So ended up connecting with the TA Associates healthcare team, fell in love with that group of people in Boston and moved to Boston to do their traditional three-year associate program. So that was my first entree into private equity. Uh, wow, so we could just dive in at <laughs> a lot of places here, but maybe what is, uh, what is one particularly formative experience from banking? Um, we, <laughs> well, formative in the sense of um, literally every day we were being asked to put two publicly traded companies together and just see what that would look like. So there were a ton of learnings from that, just from a finance 101 perspective. More interestingly, um, because the bankers that were so senior that founded Centerview were such trusted advisors for some of these CEOs in the CPG space in particular, um, being part of those teams, we got to work on way more interesting stuff than I think I would have at a, at a bigger bank. It wasn't just all pitches. It was writing the press release um, and carefully scripting the language around why, for example, Pepsi wanted to acquire their bottlers and bring them the rest of the stake in-house. And so um, I just generally can't imagine a bank where an analyst would have been that intimately involved in helping draft that with the CEO of, of an organization like that. So just in terms of flat out exposure and learnings, amazing. Going into Radian. Uh, yes. Why didn't you just stay at TA or go to another firm, you know, similar size, probably making some good cash and then having some relative stability. I mean, why start a new fund with a family? <laughs> and <laughs> I was pregnant at the time too. Um, so yeah, def definitely an opportunity. So I did have a stop, I, just to be clear, I did have a stop for about six years at a firm called FTV Capital after New York. Oh, okay. Uh, after okay. TA, <laughs> so we're going to dive into FTV. Yeah, where I covered enterprise technology and that was uh, another growth equity firm a little bit smaller than, than TA. Um, to answer your question, Specifically, it was Jordan and Weston. So I don't know if you've had an opportunity to meet them, but they're my two fellow investment partners here. They were at Bain Capital Ventures previously. And I had gotten to know them when I was at FTV because I worked on, I looked at a few of their portfolio companies um, from the perspective of prospective follow-on opportunities. And um, when I reconnected with them when they left Bain and were considering Radian, um, I was just blown away. I when mean- who, who's, um, how did it come about? So um, we have a ton of mutual friends in common. And yeah. um, when they reached out and said, do you want to build this with us? Um, I was intrigued because their reputations preceded them as great investors, but more importantly, given our overlap in, in friends, despite we were not you know friends, we're just sort of peers, um, they, be, they came so highly recommended, just solid, good people who were excited about building something and taking a little bit more of an entrepreneurial approach to investing. And so that initially resonated with me. And then honestly, after the first few conversations with them, um, I was pretty much sold. I think personally for me, the idea of building a culture and a brand and a team from scratch, those opportunities don't come around very often, especially at this juncture in our respective careers, it was sort of now or never. And these firms that are excellent growth equity firms have been around for decades and decades and um, are pretty large. And so on one hand, I think we all felt like we were getting pulled away um, from the deals that got us most excited, which more often than not were companies that had been very capital efficient to date, um, resided in cities five through 50 of the US, did not have access to um, a growth equity check in sort of the 10 to $25 million range, and didn't need the 25, 50, 75 million dollar checks that the coastal growth equity firms were yeah. needing to write given fund size requirements. And so um, it was definitely a combination of 
this was the deal that we liked. We wanted to back companies that needed this check size that were at that execution risk phase of their life cycle, had already sort of established product and market fit, and wanted to bring on a partner to help them accelerate growth or take some chips off the table or some combination of both. When, when you are part of a larger firm, um, you have impact, but not nearly the same amount of impact on culture and brand as you would from you know sitting back thinking, if we were to construct a firm today, what would it look like and, and how would we go about it? And for me, that was incredibly exciting. And to do it with those two guys was just something I couldn't pass up. What's the dynamic between the three of you? Like, how are you different? So I used to think that I was um, in it's the- Similar in enough to make this thing work. Yeah. I think um, where we overlap is love of the job, um, desire to uh, keep Radian's brand um, sort of on point, pristine, never, never get it to a situation where we feel like um, you know, who we are and what we represent is at risk, even at the expense of losing a good deal. Um, and we care deeply about the people that work here and the culture we're trying to create. Um, and so strategically, I aligned very well in that regard. Personality, the three of us couldn't be more dissimilar. Um, we share intensity um, and, and passion for the job, but uh, they're very different people. They're very different people. If we were to fast forward 10 years from now, mm -hmm. looking back and you can point to something and say, I was successful, we were successful at Radian because of this, how do you define success? Could be financially, obviously LPs want it to be financially, um, but how, how would you define success when you look back 10 years? I mean, you have to have the financial component. I mean, that's table stakes. We are here because our LPs have, have given us this money and trusted us with their capital. So first and foremost, I'm lo looking back, I hope we are on our third or fourth fund at that point, um, with many successful proof points to show for <clears throat> the strategy working. Honestly, the the team that we've built will be really important to me and maintaining the culture that we have. Um, I have seen, a, I have a lot of friends who work in, in different private equity firms and culture is pervasive and um, it really starts from the top down. And so um, for me, ensuring that we continue to hire really good people who represent Radiance brand well, this is now my baby. And so I feel so much more ownership for Radian than I ever have felt for an organization I've worked for before. And I want to be very careful about the people that we bring onto the team to um, help purport and, and promote this brand. And so looking back, I want to have a solid team. I want to have a group of people who are happy to be here and are intellectually stimulated. Um, and who are excited about you know what we can do next. Yeah, it's funny when you find very smart, talented people who are happy, then LPs tend to be happy as well. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Everyone get, tends to get what they want. Um, so, on the point about babies, that's a good maybe it's a good segue over to family <laughs> life. Uh, <laughs> you are a mother of two, married, and also have your third corporate baby here. Yep. Uh, how do you do it? Do you think that you successfully balance the three? How have you gotten to this point to balance it? I think, I mean, carefully and delicately, to be honest. Um, if I have to say, if I'm good at one thing, um, I've now realized because I've been forced to realize this, it's compartmentalizing my life. So I'm very good at force ranking the things that I care about and the, the things that I don't and the things that I don't care as much about or don't have time to do right now, doing my best to outsource them. Um, I come from a belief, and again, this is just my point of view, that you can't have it all and you can't do it all, so you better focus the limited bandwidth you have and the time and energy and focus on the things that matter most to you. So I guess I'll give you an example. I actually do like to cook, but um, if I have two hours at home when I get home between the kids going to bed and, and me walking in the front door, I certainly am not going to be using it to prepare some extravagant meal for Mark and me, especially considering the kids have already eaten. So what do we do? We, sometimes we're eating mac and cheese that are left over from the kids, or sometimes one of us has a work dinner. It's just something that for a lot of people would maybe stress hour, them out. one hour, two hours quality time Correct. is more important than 
uh, a, a better meal. Correct. And, and, and so I, I walk in the door, I put my, my stuff down, and I am solely focused on the kids for the next two hours until 9.30 when they go to bed. And so um, for me, that's how I have uh, chosen to prioritize. I know it's not for everyone, but that's what keeps me sane. It keeps me focused on the things that matter and I think makes the, the, the it work. I think the other thing, and I, I can't um, not mention them, but I have an amazing babysitter and she is an incredibly hard worker and she is super flexible around travel, which is essential because both Mark and I are traveling frequently during the week. And so having someone home that I trust and respect and I know is loving my kids and doing the right thing and sort of representing us as, as well as um, they can is huge. And then Mark carries his weight at home. So um, I happen to have a spouse who is equally as committed to making Rainy a success. And I don't think I could have done this if he had been lukewarm about me jumping into this, especially given where I was at, you know, eight weeks pregnant when I first started talking to, to Weston and Jordan about um, building Radian with them. Did he ever say, or did you ever kind of discuss together, you know what, does anyone know that like, you're pregnant? You probably shouldn't be starting a company. Because I, I remember July 2016 on the back porch in, in our apartment in Hoboken, my wife told me, don't go get a job. You have to start a business. And I was thinking, you're, it, it's okay. You're pregnant. I'm fine going off and getting some stability for the family. Yeah. Um, but what, what kind of discussion did you and Mark have? And kind of how did you, like, really, what, is there a point when you said, no, I am, let's go, we're going forward with this. It's going to be a little more difficult, but this is important to all of us. He was even more bullish than I was, to be honest. Um, <clears throat> I tend to be a little bit more risk averse by nature than he. And so um, him hearing the story and, uh, and, and feeling the passion that I felt for Jordan and Weston um, and why I was so excited about potentially partnering with them, he was like, you're going to regret this if you don't do it. And his point of view is there's never an opportune time to leave a wonderful firm to try your hand at starting your own, having never built your own firm previously. So um, I, I don't know. I guess it would have been um, impossible to try to time anything perfectly. So no, it was never really a consideration. Actually, the most important conversation when I first spoke to Weston and Jordan about the prospect of, of Radian I told them in that initial conversation, you know, I wouldn't be telling anyone this because it's still so early, but you should both know that I'm, you know, eight weeks pregnant. And um, guys, does this change anything? The, the, re the reaction <laughs> said it all. They said, great. Uh, turns out uh, Weston's wife had the same due date as I did. Um, and Jordan's wife was due two months prior to us. And um, it was a non-event. They were like, fantastic. We're not hiring you for the next year where we're partnering with you for the next hopefully 10 20 years and i'm so happy i brought it up because nothing more could have spoken volumes about the types of people they were and the commitment that they had to um me as a sort of integral member of the team so this goes to the next point which is you know around one percent of private equity firms in the u.s have a female founder or co-founder most women, when they get to call it 30 to 35, get up, the VP level, they're ready, and it's like, I either am thinking, I'm either thinking about having a kid or I'm on to number two, and it's like, all right, exit stage right mm -hmm. for one reason or another. Um, my, from my limited exposure to this, what I've kind of observed and learned from this type of interviews is that it, it seems like more people are getting into the funnel, but then it's like mid funnel is where people are exiting. Like, yeah. how do we, uh, one, are my observations accurate? And then also, two, how do we address keeping women in finance? And maybe this is also a dynamic of growth equity, which is with earlier stage companies or even seed stage uh, investing, which is, you know, needs more diversity, et cetera, as opposed to buyout private equity. I don't know if it's a function of that. Maybe from a high level, how do we how do we tackle this issue? Like what's a game plan? What's a view one of this game plan? <laughs> yeah, no, it's definitely not it's definitely not an easy an easy um, problem to solve. Especially because the job at a mid level and above for some women isn't what they want to do. I mean, I think we're supposing that um, that my day to day 
is something that so many people covet, which I don't necessarily know if that's, if that's true. Um, I don't think that solves the problem around getting more people into the funnel so that they have an option to consider that path on a go forward basis. But um, I would, I think it would be unfair to say that, that people aren't opting out for um, certain reasons that might be positive. Um, in terms of, of your stats, um, Allraise has some really interesting stats on their website. The last time I looked, I think one of them was um, 71% of venture firms, however they define their sample set, uh, does not have a single female investment partner. Um, and that's not even including founders, that's just a single investment partner. So clearly there's a lot of work to be done, especially given how much we know about the importance of diversity of thought and opinion around the table and, and sort of how it impacts investment returns. Um, but there's no easy, perfect answer. I think the way I try to address this on a daily basis is um, uh, in multiple ways. I think first and foremost, being a connector. So spending more time and more energy identifying women, being helpful to women that might not necessarily be coming through the traditional channels like a stack of resumes that are coming from a recruiting firm that you hired and thinking more creatively about why a particular candidate could be ripe for investing background, but not necessarily have the same, you know, backdrop prior to that, that made them as an obvious as a choice. And that's just, that's just, you know, legwork that we need to continue to do and be open-minded about. Um, secondly, and this is something that I try to do is um, support the women that are already in the industry as much as possible. So that to me is not, you know, going to a, women in finance cocktail party twice a year and thinking that you've done your job. It's working um, every single day or every single week to help other women improve the likelihood of success in their careers. And so as an example, a few of us have some, a, a few growth equity female peers um, and I have standing monthly calls. Just Friday, 10 a.m., um, we put it on the calendar gives us an opportunity, a forced opportunity every month if schedules are crazy to talk about what they're seeing in the market, what leads potentially would be most relevant to me that may have not necessarily been a fit for their firm, um, what they've liked, what they've disliked, any talent that they've seen from a recruiting perspective that they might not have an opening for, but God, you need to jump yeah. on this individual. Yeah. And How big is that group? Right now, I'm, right now I'm doing it with like three or four people. Yeah. Um, I have no context around what other people are doing or yeah. if other people are doing this as well. But for me, I just am, I don't want to sit around and talk about the pain points. I want to talk about them, acknowledge them, and then figure out how to make each other as successful as possible. And so um, figuring out venues to do that as opposed to just, you know, the high level superficial networking. Um, if I can get a peer of mine and then you get 20 deal, resumes the next day and... Right, yeah. right. So, so that's something that I that I spend a lot of time focused on. And I think the last piece is continuing to support the organizations that do put a lot of energy and effort um, and talent around building these communities. So organizations like All Raise or the Veneta Project, um, or even, um, I don't know if you've met Sushin and, and Jessica, who have built this Women in VC network and have spent a ton of time pulling this together. And now it is an incredible database of women across the world that um, I can sort by fund and strategy and title and location to improve my potential to collaborate with them, to communicate with them, to help them further their careers. And so um, any ways that, that each one of, I think, I think we all owe it to the community to continue to spend time, even if it's an additive task in an already busy day. What is a famous failure that you've had in your life that maybe sets you up for future success? Um, so it's probably maybe an event is probably a better a better way to describe it. And, and sorry to get personal and heavy, but we're it's particularly top of mind because we're coming up on the one year anniversary of a dear friend of mine passing. And um, he was just an incredible individual. He was always trying to improve himself um, intellectually, physically, emotionally, and unexpectedly passed away and left behind a wife and, and two children under the age of five. And for me, that was the first event of my life that was as traumatic as it was, where it was really eye-opening. It was, how dare I sweat the small stuff? How dare I get worked up about things that are so trivial and insignificant 
whether it's in work or something I'm stressed out about at home or something one of my children said. And um, it's natural to sort of forget that feeling um, as time goes on, but I've been super focused on every time something little blip on the radar screen occurs to hug my kids a little tighter, to um, call my friends more frequently, to appreciate the people here at Radian, and hopefully, um, again, don't don't sweat the small stuff. So I think I have uh, a, a different outlook on life than I did before, even in the face of sort of this tragedy. Do you have a mentor? Have you had a mentor throughout your life? A river guide? I would say role model is probably a better a better um, uh, word because I think mentor sort of apply implies job. Um, it's kind of cheesy because it's my mom, but um, a woman who has taught me immensely. Um, she is tough, but she's loving and kind, and she has the highest EQ of any individual I've met. And I bring that up specifically because in a world and in an industry where developing relationships is critical, um, her ability to walk into a room or walk into any situation, regardless of, of who's there and what's going on, and have a conversation with someone and not only find something in common with that individual, but put that person at ease in the yeah. conversation is a remarkable trait. And she worked my entire life. Um, I never felt like I was not, I did not have enough attention or, or guidance from her. And I've definitely tried to emulate a lot of that, um, a, a lot of what she brings to the table and in my life. And honestly, I think at the end of the day, if, if my kids even feel a modicum of the respect and love and awe and wonder for me as, as I did for her, um, I will consider motherhood a success. All right. Well, we have covered a lot today. Thanks, Thanks for doing this. If you have comments, questions, drop them in to this video. Thanks a lot. Thank you.